the Lakota Sioux, how cool are Say how? How? Cool up. Cool up. That means hello, my friend. And this talk is Lila Washte. Can you say Lila? Lila. Washte. Washte. Okay, again. Lila Washte. Lila Washte. That's very good. That means very good. So, so this talk is. I didn't say any of you was very good. I said the talk was very good. No, I'm just teasing you. Well, you're looking at a man in his 80th year. I was born on an Indian reservation in a very remote spot in South Dakota, alongside a river. My grandfather, great-grandfather's house was 80 foot long and 40 foot wide. They used the teepees to buffalo hunt. That was like uh, we have a mobile home now, see, or a trailer, okay? But we had a great log house, and it was called the main lodge, and all my grandfather's sons and sons lived with them. They married and moved into this big house. And they learned to live with one another and to respect one another and to learn to love one another like we all should do. I was uh, Two years old when the elders took me and seven other boys to be taught the language, the songs, the ceremonies, and the traditions that belong to the Lakota. And then we had a hunk of pop, a band, from what I that meant they was the oldest teachers, the advisors to the other tribes. And most of them, what we call uh, healers. This society would know them as medicine men, or holy men, what you would say. Anyway, they took me and these other kids, and they raised us till we were 12 years old. I never seen, he was kept away from the contact of the white people. We kept away from the school. We couldn't go there anyway, because we was in them. But we was kept away from those schools. So I was 12 years old. And then I went to a Catholic Indian mission school. Where they, where I went in August and didn't get home till May. I stayed there in the school. But during the course of my learning the survival methods, the ways to live, knowing the outdoors, the animals that, and how they reacted to us, all this I learned as I grew up. And when I was four years old, I was running a mile. That was every other day. When I was eight, I was running 20 miles every other day. My grandfather said, grandfather said, that you can't depend on nobody but yourself. You must learn it. You, might, and you can't depend on even your horse to be stable. So you have to learn to run. So run we ran. We ran and ran. When I was 12, I was running 36 miles every other day. And we'd run without water on hot days to teach us how to survive in these particular, uh, and to 
to put forth an effort to do it. Get it done. So I learned these things. And they made me strong. So that when I went into the white man's school, I could absorb his teaching and understand and be attentive. And that's what you've got to do. You've got to listen. You've got to listen to what they say. For if you don't, you're going to miss them. And what you miss might be the most important thing in the world. That little thing that you miss. So, I could pay attention and I went through the schools and I graduated at the proper time of my age, which I was 17 from high school. So you see, it took five years for me to get through what you're going to do to go to high school, to get to high school. But I know you kids can do it. You've got all the things in the world to do it with. We didn't have nothing. Oh, I think we had the best. We had the outdoors, we had the, we had the trees, we had the great spirit. But you have a learning process. You've got all the tools to do it, to become really great people, each and every one of you. And don't forget, when the great spirit made you, he made, made you just as if you was going to be the only person in this whole universe. He made us all the same, but different. Well, I got black eyes. Somebody's got blue eyes. And somebody's got blonde hair. And I got gray hair. He used to be black, but he made us all the same, but only different. But he gave each one of you the talent to do with what you want. <coughs> and you can do it if you just listen to your elders, listen to your teachers, listen to your parents, listen to your ministers. Everybody has something to offer. Get big ear. Listen. Because if you miss one thing that might be really important in your life, that you miss, you might not make it. But I know you're all going to make it. You have to. Because you've got the best teachers, you've got the best facilities in the world. At your disposal. A sentence wore moxen. Sometimes you only wore breech cloth, like you'd wear shorts. And that's all we had. And if we had winter leggings was made out of the skins of the buffalo. This is a buffalo, see? Right here. I took that and I took the buffalo hide and stretched it and dehaired it took the hair off it and wet it and then I put it over this drum and put all this lacing on it and when it dried it tightened that up really tight. So it goes. Eagle Butte, South Dakota. And we call 
called it Eagle Butte because the eagles would always come and land there. So we dug a pit. And we put railings of old ash trees across there with openings. And then <coughs> we tied a dead rabbit up there. And here would come the eagle down, see? And when he'd land, we'd drive him by the foot. Bucky's feathers. And to, you know, we wouldn't take him up to where he couldn't fly, <laughs> but we didn't kill him either. But only <clears throat> the Indians are supposed to have this feather. But I know a lot of other people's got them. You know, and they say it's against the law. It is against the law for you to kill an eagle because they're an endangered species. And <clears throat> people are trying to look out for them. But this is the, the feather off of one live eagle. He wasn't dead. And it's an honor for an Indian to have it because the eagle is strong in his flight. He can see, he's far seeing. He can see forever. That's why he can be up there in the air for a while. You see that little mouse in comes down and he plucks up the mouse. That's his food. He takes it back to the to the nest and gives it to his baby. For the Indian honors him, that he's honored in the Indian way of being strong. And my name, my Indian name is Mato <coughs> Wombly. That means eagle bear. And I had to earn the name. My first name, which I carry, is City, S-I-B-B-Y. And that means helper and aid to the people. And I had to live that. They gave that to me when I was but a child, and I had to live that. And I am still trying to aid you children so that you'll know a little bit about the original America. Because my people didn't have no cross to cross no waters to get here. They was greeting the people that came. I made this I made this <coughs> it's called a dream catcher. Do you understand what this wedding is? Okay. You hang it above something that you go to sleep and uh -huh. bad dreams that make them good. Yeah, that's what it says. Someone said they were going to read it. According to the Indian legend, dreams are messages from sacred spirits. It is said that the small hole in the web, see the small hole? allows the good dreams through while trapping the bad dreams until they disappear in the morning light. Dream catchers are believed to protect the sleeping one with pleasant dreams and good luck and harmony from the great spirit. So that's what's called a dream catcher. Uh, these, this is horse hair. This is horse hair. And this is a symbol of our th great Thunderbird. And this is elk hide. And that's what we call a dream picture. Okay? This is the one. This is a, a, a make believe. Uh, what they call a gourd. It's one of nature's uh, <coughs> They grow and they'll grow. They'll look like uh, uh, cucumbers. They'll look like uh, squash. But uh, the Indian took this particular one that grows like that. And this is his rain rattle. 
I guess that's in Jesus. These are the rain dam rattles. The American Indian has made rattles from gourd for centuries. Uses have ranged from simple percussion instruments and rolls to elaborate ceremonies such as rain dances. Uh, these rattles are by a Lakota from South Dakota, now residing in Grand Island. That's me. <laughs> And they they put little stones into it. Little white stones that you find in ant pile. And these ants gather these little white stones. Nobody knows where they come from. Only the ants gather them. Nobody's ever found where these white <coughs> stones come from. <coughs> so we the Indians thought that maybe they came from the rainbow. So we put a hundred of them in there so that we can have a hundred days a year, a hundred days a year for rain. And then they would all gather and they would dance rain dance. And sometimes it rain, sometimes it wouldn't. <laughs> I think sometimes when it did rain, I think it was consequential. Incidental. Okay, what else I got? Oh, this one. This one here was given to me by an old lady who is dead now. This was her her fan dance. You know, she danced you know, got one it'd be a hot summer day and she'd be dancing, she'd fan herself. See. They made bigger ones, but she made a smaller one like that, see. And so I just kept it. It's uh, just a keepsake to me. It's uh made out of a uh, 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 sage ham, which is a big grouse. And this is uh, uh, a sack, a medicine bag, we call it. Everybody, all the, the Indian warriors and the ladies and everybody had one someplace. And in there was put things that they believed it was keepsakes, what, what you people would call keepsakes. They would put them in here. And they... They just knew <coughs> once it was in there, that, that would keep them. And then they had some pipe stone in there for, 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 from the pipe stone piece of pipe, <laughs> pipe piece pipe. That kind of <coughs> but anyway, this this would then would protect the warriors in battle. It protected me. <coughs> I was in a war, in World War II, <coughs> I spent 32 months in combat. I got shot up a little bit, but it saved me. I think that's what saved me. Plus praying a lot. And this here is, this was made, um, 1842, this was made, and it's a it's a message pouch. They would put certain things in there, and it would be carried by the runners that would run those long distances, and would take that to another tribe or to the to another hunting party or something. And it was given to me. When I was just a little boy. This is what we call the Joker. See, I see it's got a strap on. It was more like this. See, with a decoration for uh, uh, 
for either just for show or for dancing. But I, and then speaking of the war, I, I carved this from a sketch off a picture I had. <coughs> I lost him in Vietnam. <coughs> They flew him back to Travis Air Force Base in uh, Washington, and he died there. But uh, uh, he was in Vietnam, and uh, I just thought I'd bring this along and show you that I do do a little carving. He's your son, Larry, right? Yes, sir. That's his son. This is what my grandma used for a soup spoon. And that's uh, comes off. They she made about four of them off the buffalo horn. The buffalo horn kind of comes like that, and they, that they use that. And that's what they did. They used every part of that buffalo. They not only ate the meat. Used these horns and the bones and everything, nothing in this place. <coughs> they used every part of it to live. <coughs> and this one, <coughs> this is what they call a, a spirit pouch. It's real old, too. Uh, <coughs> uh, by burning the roots of the red willow and preserving the ashes, the Indian believed this would give him strength and kindness for his neighbor. This pouch held the ashes. I didn't know I was coming. I, I figured when I reached the age of 80 that I was not going to go to the schools anymore because I had lost my, my spouse for 51 years and I just give it up till I give away all my stuff except some of this stuff here and I make these and, and uh, so I, my Youngest son has most of my, my stuff that I have. He's got all my custom, my war bonnet, my regalia. This is a fishing boat that I built in Washington. It was a commercial fishing boat. And I fished on it. To, uh, <coughs> vacation time and any free time I had while I was out in the ocean fishing commercially. And this I carved out a soapstone, that rock that grows in the cliff. I carved them here just before Christmas. <coughs> Anybody got any questions? How long does a buffalo hunt take? How long does a buffalo hunt take? When you go on a buffalo hunt, how long, oh, oh, how long does it how take? Long? Yeah. <laughs> I'm hard of hearing too. Too many bombs. World War II. Uh, well, we already know where they're at by the dust they're, they're putting up when they're traveling. And uh, so sometimes it may take a week, but it used to take a lot longer when they didn't have the horses. See. They would surround them and drive them off the cliffs. See. And there'd be maybe a hundred buffalo down there. And they took what they needed. And 
this is society say would say that <coughs> not so because the birds would feed off the other animals would feed off them and it would deteriorate and go back to the earth. Um, about have you ever been in three weeks. Have you ever been in an Indian War? Indian War? <clears throat> no. Lots well, of Japanese war. <laughs> no, that was in World War II. Um, no, no, that was just like I say for either going to like you put on your best suit to go to church. You put one of those on. Go see your girlfriend. <laughs> Do you still have the buffalo? Do I still have buffalo? Yes. On our reservation, we got a big, big herd. I even got buffalo hides in my shop right now that I need to fix. Class, he just made this drum right there from a buffalo two months ago. So he takes the hide and he tans it and he makes the stuff still from buffalo. And this was this was one of our war canoes at the Sioux <coughs> And I took him I took some old green firewood that a fellow brought me. I stripped this from the inner part and put this together. So, um, where do you, how do you make the drum? Okay. Well, this cedar log, I went over to Philip, and they had a cedar tree there, and I bought this for $5. And I sawed it. And I took my chainsaw and I hollowed it out. And then I took this hide and soaked it in water. And then I had this all cut out and I laced it. And then I let it dry. I took too thin of a, uh, a tube one day and I put this hide on there, on it, both sides. And I laced it and it dried and it crushed me. <laughs> so he says, though, if he takes that hide now and would get it damp or wet, it would become soft again. Yeah, this will, and if it gets, yeah. Ah. Um, did you go, ever go, like, on dances and parties? Do what? Dances and parties? Dances? Did you go, did you have Indian dances or parties? Oh, yeah. or? Uh, I used to hoop dance. I can't anymore. I just had my knee operated on by that day. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I used to hoop down. Now I've got both artificial knees. Yeah. But I'd have, I did <clears throat> 26 hoops. And I performed all over for the endings, you know. I didn't go. Some of the schools I went to, not that I knew. Yeah. Yeah. This? The fuzzy stuff on the end. Oh. This is a, a, what they call macrame cord. See, it looks like this. Before I, I don't know, now it's <coughs> in a great, <coughs> And this rubber ball belonged to my little doll. That was her fetch ball. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's mine. process takes about uh, 14 days, the whole process to get it like this. And then it's dried, see? And when I go to use this, well, I'll, I'll probably cut this out to this size, see? About that much smaller than what I need it. And then I'll go ahead and wet it down, and then that's when I stretch it that far. How do you cut it? Cut it? I cut it with a with the scissors. Uh, and it used to be with sharpen uh, the buffalo bones and have to cut it. Now with all this modern stuff, I mean, it's got good old sharp scissors. Yeah. What? Well, 
right? What do you guys do for birthdays? Birthdays? Oh, we have a big power. You know, big fans could come, Indians would come. <coughs> the Makota uh, would come from <coughs> different places. The Dakota would come. The Apaches would come. When he says the word Indian, he's from this reservation in South Dakota, the Cheyenne in Indian Reservation, and they don't say the D in the word Indian. He says, say it. They say in it. <laughs> That's the way to say that. Yes. Do you make lots of arrowheads? Yeah, I can make arrowheads. I give them all away now. I don't have any arrowheads. Yeah. What? On that boat. The boat you made. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. Did you make a big real one? Yeah. You did? Yeah. He fished on a big real one. No. It was, you, uh, it was 40 foot long. Did you didn't make, make it. Did you make it? No, didn't make it. I made it out of uh, old orchard cedar. But you he didn't make the real boat. That's what you're thinking, right? The real boat that was in the water? The one that was 40 feet long? <laughs> yeah, I made that. The one that was 40 feet yeah. long? Yeah. You did make that? Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh. Oh. I had to make that. Oh. I, uh, I, <coughs> I needed a place, so I went down there on the Puget Sound. And there was an old Finlander down there. He used to make boats, and he still had this thing. Uh, a dock. So I asked him, I said, do you mind if I use that? I said, I'll pay you for it. Uh, what are you going to do? I said, well, I want to hire you. I said, well, you just sit there and tell me. The, the, the biggest trouble I figured I was going to have, I'm a mechanical engineer. He has what his degree is in mechanical engineering. Yeah. He worked yeah. as a mechanical engineer. Yeah, I thought that I'd have this curving here, but it had to curve. You see, it had to curve too, and then come at, like this too. See, as it went. So I give him two thousand dollars for him to sit there and tell me. Oh, and then he had a stick. And he'd be hitting that. Every evening I have to bring him a pint of whiskey. <laughs> <coughs> and he, he told me, he said, that's too short. He said, no, over there. He <laughs> so I took him, I measured it. Sure enough, it was a half inch short. <laughs> and he'd tell me like that, certain things. But anyway, got it I built it. With these instructions. Yeah. Did you make all that stuff? Most of it I did, yes. Some of it I. Uh, let's see. I didn't make that. I didn't make this. I made this. And is that exactly how your boat looks? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. City? Show them the switch that you used to make to sell to cowboys. You know, the thing that you used, that you made to, to sell to cowboys. Oh, I think you yeah, forgot yeah. to show them that. It's on the back table. <coughs> These cowboys use this, like this, to train their horses. <laughs> So we learned how to do that braiding, see? I, did, uh, I didn't do this one. I can do it. But my brother, my oldest brother, he's a little older than I am. He's almost 90. <laughs> he gave it to me for a wedding present. And he said, I said, it's just to keep my wife in mind. <laughs> you know what I wouldn't give you that. <laughs> But this is what they train our horses with. Does it take you a long time to braid things? Like that? No. Like no. that handle? On no. the... On, <coughs> on the jump <coughs> No. Neither. Neither this either. See 
that's all great. <laughs> what? It's <laughs> <Some> bad folks. <laughs> Oh, that holds my boat. That's a stand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those things with little beads? These? No. No, these, these is uh, what they hang by the... They hang out of papoose yeah. where the baby's carried on. Well, <coughs> it was an entertainment device, see? It would hang. It's like a little rattle for the baby. In front of them like this, and see. And they would, and they'd bat like that, and come back and hit them in the nose. <laughs> Teach them to duck. <laughs> Way over there. Well, what happens during a um, American Indian ceremony? What? What happens during an Indian ceremony? What happens? Well, depending on what ceremony it is. Like a spiritual if ceremony? If it's a spiritual one, lots of praying and lots of songs that go with the spirit. And that, that indicates the, 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 the rhythm of your heartbeat and the pulse of the earth and the great spirit sending down his message to the pulse and then through here and then to this we get it and respond to all the people that that is the spiritual so <coughs> it was going on a war path it was a little bit different so you don't want to know about that <laughs> um, did you carve that boat yeah, yeah, I made that. Yeah. Um, how long does it exactly take to carve a boat like that? Like that? Yeah. Let's see, that probably took oh, a total of eight hours because I didn't work on it all the time. I'd be working on it and my wife would tell me that she needed something done. Let it go. They do what she commanded. <laughs> and I want to tell you boys something. Now listen up. To the end, the woman was put way up, the female. She was put there and held in the highest esteem because of the fact that she could make life when she gave birth to a baby. So that's why they held her in the highest, highest esteem. And uh, uh, so I want you to know that the women was the highest of any of anything that I ever read in any history or any civilization, we had it for the woman in the highest esteem. Do you still have your boat? Hmm? Do you still have your boat? No, no, I sold it. How many Indian languages can you speak? How many English, how many of those dialects? I speak all seven dialects of my uh, Sioux language, or Lakota, or Dakota, and I speak 13 other different languages. I have a question for you. I was talking to Jack earlier, and Jack said that you prefer to be called American Indian instead of Native oh, yeah. American. Uh, Is that Native. Native American isn't uh, us. It's not us. We're American. American Indians are. Uh, uh, because the Native American is uh, coming from the South Sea Island or Puerto Rico or Haitian <coughs> or any of the Dominican Republic and uh, even from 
South America, some of the blacks claim that they're uh, Native Americans. So to uh, remain as the original American, not that we, we want any more to be away from them or with them or anything like that. It's just, it's just the fact that we choose to still be the original American. Did you have a tribe that was an enemy to the Lakota Sioux? Mm -hmm. Crow. Crow. He was always hanging around the fort. He sold out to the whites. <laughs> <laughs> and he was always sneaking around and scouting mm -hmm. for them. See? Crow. Crow in there. Sitting bulls from Canada go down to the border of Texas is where he was. And then from uh, Minnesota clear to the, uh, Idaho is where his territory was. That was the Lakota territory. Can you tell them anything that you know about Sitting Bull? Uh, my grandfather, my great -grand grandfather, was most interested in children and their welfare. He needed always many negotiations to let the people know that the children were to become first and that their education was uppermost with he and his tribe. So consequently, I followed his footsteps and I have I have come to the schools and volunteered my time for 55 years. And I haven't regretted one minute. It's been a pleasure. And I've seen some people grow up and I've seen them uh, drop, a hardcore drop out from school wind up as engineers in Notre Dame through some of our efforts from the Indian Center, which I was affiliated with. Uh, Sitting Bull was a, a great leader of these people. He was a great leader. And he was a very kind and gentle man, but a great boy. Do you have anything of sitting bowls? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. It's with your son, though, isn't it? Huh? It, what you have of sitting bowls yeah, is with your all, son. It's all with me. I got a couple pieces at the house. They're kind of ceremonial, you know. I don't, yeah. uh, I don't uh, bring them out. But uh, he'll get those, too, so. But I got, I got to eat blood. <laughs> well, this one horse, uh, I, had, I called him Steamboat because he liked to swim. We lived right by a river, so he'd drop off in there and he'd swim. So I called him Steamboat. <laughs> and the last horse I had about four years ago was a great big horse. He was mean. So I call him amigo. And that in Spanish means my friend. Yeah. I call him amigo, see. <laughs> and he became my friend. Yeah. Um, do you speak a little Spanish? Huh? Do you speak a little Spanish? Do you speak, no. you speak any Spanish? No, I can, I, I can learn it if I'm around it, because I'm very good at languages. The first language I learned was Latin, 
before learning English, because I went to a Catholic Indian mission school. <laughs> Sibby, when I met Sibby, he had students coming up to the hospital to visit him, and I couldn't figure out they were different nationalities. And it's because Sibby helps teach these kids and people English as a second language. So he's met all kinds of people that speak all kinds of languages. Yeah, I teach a class now for English as a second language, and I got a Colombian that speaks Spanish. And I have a uh, uh, Vietnamese. Uh, two Vietnamese, one Lao, and I'm supposed to have a couple more uh, coming. I don't know what their nationality is. Do you speak any Pawnee? What? Do you speak Pawnee? Can you speak Pawnee? Yeah. Can you go to Pawnee? I said, I speak it very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What kind of languages can you speak? What kind of language do I speak? Uh -huh. Like what? Like what My, other kind? I grew I grew up with Lakota. Nishali Lakota. Me esteem esteemen or some people And you and they told me you better learn it well. <laughs> yeah. Was the Sioux really mean? Huh? Was the Sioux really mean? Were the Sioux Indians mean? Sioux? Uh-huh. That was a name that the United States government and the French gave us. It's a derivant from uh, the Chippewa. The Goja Tua. And it means little snake. Because we could hide in the grass. I was telling you about me yeah. hiding when I was a kid. Right. Uh, we could hide in the grass and stand up among them. And the element of surprise is always the best. So they start calling us a little. And little so the French picked it up and they called it just Sioux. S O U. Then uh, the government spelled it S I O U X. So that's what we go by. He like said, I go by the boat. Yeah. He said in his training as a child, up to there was, up till he was twelve years old, one of the things that they did to teach him to be survivalists is they would send him out and make him hide and then the elders would come out and try to find him, right? And they never did find Sibby. So he I get around that sage question. <laughs> Dirt on me, too, since so I look like dirt. I've watched it, too. Did they step on you before? Huh? Did they step on you before? No. <laughs> uh, so. Oh. <laughs> Did you know any other Indian tribes? Yes, I know a lot. I know a lot. You see, we was uh, we would go into these islands in World War II where they was going to invade. And we jump in and we would take the soundings and loose the mines that was there, turn them loose, so they'd go into the stream, and then the minesweepers would pick them up, hopefully. But uh, and then when it come time to break radio silence and me give all the soundings how far the, uh, the ships could come in, where the best landing for the uh, landing craft was. Uh, I would call, i break the way to radio silence and say, heavy tile of coat in the And they'd know who I was. See? So then he'd say, well, now we got to we got a Navajo. Well, put him on. <laughs> and I'd give him the thing. So I had to be able to speak quite a few languages. Yeah, they never declared that the Navajo Indian um, language did they in World War II? Yeah, they had they had code talks. But Lakotas did too. But but um in World War Two did 
Did the Japanese ever decode that? Oh, they couldn't decode that. We thought we had a secret code, a different trip that, and all it was was just plain old uh, code of talk. <laughs> so you were a code talker? <coughs> you were a code talker during World War II? No, I wasn't classified that. I was classified as a frogman. Frogman? Yeah, they call them seals now. Oh. Now, I, I would guess that your training as a young boy would have helped you then well, to yeah, become I a was soldier. Training. I was training <laughs> Because, I mean, basically, you were trained then what the SEALs were yeah. as a young child. Yeah. Mm. All right. Yeah. Did you know Blackbird? Huh? Did you know Blackbird? Blackbird? Did you know him? Did you know him? The Omaha Chief Blackbird? There was an Omaha mm -hmm. Chief named Blackbird. I know of him. I didn't know him personally, no. No, because, uh, you see, the Omaha is a Suian tribe. Right. Yeah. I can speak that to you. Can you speak? Yes, we do. We're working on the basics. That's terrible. <laughs> Did you know any other chiefs? Other chiefs? Yes, I did. I'm one. They're looking at me. Are you chief? I don't know. I went through their chieftain training, too. Um, do you, do you often um, play drums a lot of time? I don't anymore. I just, I just make this kind of noise. <laughs> I can sing. I can sing all, most of the song. Yeah. Can you make a poem now? Yep. I can sure make good ones. Good one. Good one. Can you fight in desert storm? What? Can you fight in desert storm? No, 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 no. I'm too old. I'm too old. We don't let him do that with his knees. <laughs> <laughs> I knew Chief Claw, Chief Crazy Horse. Oh, did they make a personally? And Chief Fool's Crow. Mm -hmm. Chief Lennon Rattle. Mato Wombly. That's him. <coughs> His name is Mato Wombly, which is Eagle Bear, and that was also the name of Sitting Bull's father. So they repeated the name to him. <coughs> Sitting Bull's father had many names, didn't he? Because we were reading in the book that Sitting Bull's father was named Returns Again. Yeah. Uh -huh. But he had many names. Yeah, right. As right. different things happened, you guys are given the Returns names. Again, see, is the. Like, <coughs> I'm Sitting. Mm hmm. And returns again in like that's that's his name around the village or uh -huh. <coughs> but when he when he puts that chieftain robe on and he comes you know, mm -hmm. back. Were were you like afraid when you went to war to wars? <coughs> Were you afraid when you went to war? Were you afraid? Uh, no, not really. You know, I can't remember of ever being afraid. Only when I seen these people taking my wife into the Alzheimer's unit. That's the only time in my life that I have a known fear. This? Yeah. Yeah. Um. That's all right. Oh, yeah. Did you know Crazy Horse personally? Do I know? Did you know Crazy Horse personally? No, 
No, I knew his, uh, I knew his daughter. Uh, she was my grandma on my mother's side. Crazy horses. Oh, I knew you were related to Crazy Horse, too. Um, we're getting close to having to end, but um, Mrs. Salvatore has a question. Uh, I'm so sorry, kids. I know that you guys have got wonderful questions, too. Um, I just want to ask you one more question before we do put a conclusion on it, and that is, can you please explain to the kids what it was like to grow up between two worlds? You were in a very unique position in that you were a Native American or an American Indian, but yet you were also exposed to the white man's ways, and I would think that would cause a lot of conflict <coughs> in your life between the two. And when I went to, I went to translate for the elders because I could speak English when I was 14 years old at Congress, and uh, when when I was going to go there. Uh, my grandfather told me, he said, it is good that you learn of their ways, and it is good that you learn their language. He said, uh, he said, when you like the, when you like the flame on a white man's wick, he said, I wanted you to go learn of his ways, so he could bear his company. And I did that. Mm -hmm. And it was tougher than hell, let me tell you that. Mm -hmm. Excuse the friends. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming, Sidney. Thank you so yeah. much.